No. I, I was friends with Sammy Davis. Okay. Yeah, and he always had the great parties at Caesar's Palace. But uh, but you know Dean Martin occasionally we'd run into each other in, in one of the one of the casinos, but Sinatra you never you never talk yeah. to Sinatra. Yeah. I killed it, you know. <laughs> Sometimes when we touch, the honesty's too much. Whitney Houston, who had one of the greatest voices yes. I've ever known, um, I believe it was two things that that caused her to die, and it wasn't drowning in the bathtub. Those people that signed the Declaration of Independence put everything on the line, their family, their lives, their fortunes, everything. That's a patriot. Yes. That'll give everything. <clears throat> Those men and women who, who die on a battlefield, that's a patriot. It's a hero it and is. a patriot. So I get out of the car, grab the champagne, what the heck, <laughs> you know, and I walk right over to him, reach in and grab the cassette out of my pocket, and I said, trick or treat. You know what he said? What? Who are you? <laughs> I'm Rick Walker. I'm sitting down with some of my most captivating friends to discuss topics ranging from politics and business to religion and pop culture. Welcome to Conversations at the Mansion. Lee Greenwood, welcome to Conversations at the Mansion. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Appreciate you joining us. So my, my first question is, who is Lee Greenwood? Because from the outside, we see the awards, the, AMA, the CMA awards, the Grammys, the books, the, all the great work that you do with Patriots. We see the uh, lovely family, all the work you do crisscrossing the nation, inspiring our veterans. But behind the scenes, with your wife, in your home, with your friends, in your church, in your community, who, who would you say Lee Greenwood is? You remember the song, um, I'm try trying to think who the artist was. Um, I've been so many places in my life and time. Sang a lot of songs, I've made some bad rhyme. I've lived my life in stages with 10,000 people watching. I'm alone now and I'm singing this song for you. <laughs> I, I, I live that yeah. and I have lived it for the entire uh, time of my career when I got to Nashville. But before that, uh, I'm a farmer from, um, from California. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was a year old because of my father's service in World War II in the Navy in the Merchant Marine. And uh, my mother just never forgave him because we had, there were two of us, my sister and I. And my sister's still alive, lives in Boise, California, she, uh, Boise, Idaho. She's a, slightly older than I am. And, uh, and so she, uh, my mother was, had to work really hard during during those times as I was growing up as a teenager. So I was raised on a farm with my grandparents. So I learned farming, I learned carpentry, I learned a lot of different things I could have done. Uh, I lived and breathed baseball, yeah. and uh, I had to make a decision in high school if I was gonna go to the Dodgers or go and keep my musical career. So I kept the music, and at the age of 17, my grandparents gave me a 55 Chevy and, uh, and pushed me off to Nevada, and I went there at and started my career and stayed there almost 19 years in the casinos of Nevada, uh, Reno, Lake Tahoe, and, and Vegas. Um, and then I kept pursuing what I hoped would be my career. And it's kind of like, you know, when when you think you know what's going to happen, you should pretty read ask him first. Yes. Because uh, I think he knows a little better. Uh, so just when I gave up, I think, well, it's a, probably not going to happen. I was 36 or so. And then the cards began to fall into place, which would move me from Las Vegas, Nevada to, uh, to Nashville, Tennessee, and start my career there. And when it happened, it just exploded. But I'm still the same guy I was back on the farm. Um, my wife and I have two sons. We're, Kim and I have been married 29 years, gorgeous woman that she is. Yes. Graced me with two beautiful sons. We're both known, born in Nashville. I never saw Former Miss Tennessee, well done, sir. Well done. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. I, and I never thought I'd have two southern kids, but uh, living in the south long enough, and, and uh, they were both born in Nashville. Uh, Dalton, our older boy, just proposed to his girlfriend, who's uh, a, a Vandy grad, and he uh, he's getting a PhD in cancer research at Vanderbilt. Wow. And he's 20, 26, and his... His brother, 22, is a chancellor scholar at TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. So I have these wonderful sons, and my wife and I, I guarantee you, I mean, we have a celebrity life, yes, but around our neighborhood, we're just mom and 
pop carpool. You know, I yes. mean, we take we we went, lived through those those years in grammar school, early years, all the way through high school. Went all to the games, everything. Always took them to to their practices and everything. You know, so yeah. we never missed those opportunities, even though you had this overshadowing thing that takes you on the road constantly and keeps you in front of the public eye. So we, we, we try to push that kind of thing away when we're in the house. I always let my kids know we're going to work. You know, yes, that's generally yes. what we do. Wow. So, so you grew up, they kicked you out at 17, you, 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 toured the, you did the casino uh, tour, and you were discovered by Jerry Crushville at MCA Music, I, I think. Interesting story about that. I, um, because I played piano bar as well. My mother was a, a piano player. Yes. Uh, played piano and mandolin, actually. And, and we had a little piano in our, in our trailer where we were raised on the farm. And I, I was allowed to play it, generally in the dark. And I, I, there was two reasons, I think, for that. My grandmother was pretty smart in the fact that she knew if I couldn't see the keys, I'd have a better ear for the, yes. for the music, kind of like a blind person. Uh, which I would later hire a blind keyboard player, by the way, of Gordon Moat. You probably know who that is. Yes. He's, he's from Atala, Alabama, and has a great Christian career. And so I, I learned from him as well. But I, as a kid, I'm, I'm playing piano, and, and, uh, and my grandmother, I think, kept the lights out maybe because ex electricity was expensive. Yes. Maybe that was, that was the <laughs> motivation. But I, I learned to play by ear. So and when I'm playing piano bar in Vegas uh, at the Tropicana Hotel. And, uh, and I'd had several gigs around town with my, I, I had bands of all kinds. I had the Lee Greenwood Affair, I had the Mod Squad, I had different kind of names of bands that I wrote music for major shows. But this was a time when the economy hit and I pretty much had to reduce, you know, my overhead so I would work alone. Yeah. And I actually made a lot more money working alone, you know, just playing piano bar. And so I bought a record, a 45 record at the time, um, and it was... Um, Please come to Boston, and I, I I love the song because it was written by Dave Loggins from East Tennessee, and I and I still keep it in my show, by the way. But I, I, I not only played it, but then I looked at the the label on the record and, and found out who the producer was, and the producer was Jerry Crutchfield, who ran MCA Music in Nashville, Tennessee. He had also had several Dove Awards for producing for other artists, including Tanya Tucker, and um, and so I I I got on the phone and I called him. And, I, and I, I got the number, you know, it's not like you can get the phone now, you can just, you know, call, <laughs> yeah. da 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 da. And so um, he was a singer, uh, he came to town with his brothers, uh, and uh, they're from uh, Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, and so he had lost his voice. Hmm. So I, my best interpretation would be, hello, uh, is this Jerry Crutchfield? And he said, yeah, yeah, this is Jerry. Who's this? And and because his voice had gone away over the years for some reason, you know. And I said, I'm a singer in Las Vegas. And I said, I'd like to audition for you. That quick, he said, well, I, I'm going to Los Angeles next week. I, I'll stop in Vegas and see you. <laughs> Just like that. Wow. Wow. So he, uh, he came and saw me. I think at the time I'd moved over to the Flamingo. Uh, I mean, the Hilton Hotel, where I would have my own band again called uh, The Affair, and I'm opening for Bill Medley, uh, one of the Righteous mm -hmm. Brothers, yeah, yeah. and Elvis was in the main room, and so we were yeah. kind of that, that period of time. This was about 1974? Um, Somewhere let's 75? see. Uh, move further than that. Uh, 76, I think. Okay. Yeah. 76 was Elvis's last year to sing in Vegas. Right. And, and so uh, he, he said, I like what you do. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to set up a session for you in Los Angeles. And we did, went with Johnny Hobbs, a famous piano player at the time, got a quintet together and went in, did four songs on tape, and then uh, sent him to Nashville. And uh, Jim Fogelson at the MCA Records label said, I like him. He's different than the artists I just hired, which included George Strait, Reba McIntyre, Barbara Mendrell, and the Oak Ridge Boys. Wow. And so we were all on the same label together. I went there about a year later. Uh, recorded another demo with some of the songs I'd written with a Mel Tillis band, who was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And then um, I got the call and said, we want you to come to Nashville and wow. stay here. And I had to give up everything I knew in Vegas. And that was tough because I'd been there a long time. Yeah, yeah. But I did, and the rest is history. So I heard that your grandma started you out playing some Stan Kitten. Or maybe that was one of the first songs you learned to play by ear? Yes. Um, Yes, as, as, as I mentioned, I, I played yeah. piano at, at night, and my mother was rarely home. I didn't know my father until I was 15. So basically, I was on my own. Yes. And I was on a short leash, you know, for my grandparents. They were like, if I was going to go out and play with a band, 
uh, she would bring the band leader in and make him sit in the living room and, and promise that I'd be home right after breakfast. We'd close the bar at 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I'd go downtown North Sacramento and have a little something to eat in a little diner, and I'd be home because I had to be up at 6.30 to run track. And so I would just have like three or four hours sleep. But if I was never home, it's the last time I'd go out and play with him. So I would use the piano as a way to learn songs that I would play. But I was playing saxophone more than singing. I wasn't a singer really? yet. Okay. I, was playing, I was singing in church. Okay. I sang the First Baptist Church from the time I was 12 till I was 15. But, but uh, I wasn't really a singer. So I used my ear in order to learn songs off the record. Mm -hmm. So we had a 78 record of artistry and rhythm. Uh, wow. arranged by Stan Kenton, which is, wow. he was the father of American jazz. And I put it on the turntable and put that little needle down and just listen to it and listen to it and listen to it until I figured out every voicing just by ear yeah. on the piano. <laughs> and that's, I think, <clears throat> my music teacher, Fred Cooper, at, in high school, at Norte Del Rio High School, where I, I, I would eventually graduate from, uh, he said, you know, I don't think you're going to go to college, so I'm going to give you the opportunity to learn music theory. And I learned that in high school, thanks to Fred. And um, so just learning things by ear like that and then applying them to all of the instruments in the band and saxophone yes. became my main instrument, but I played all, I played trumpet as you did. Yes, or, yes, yes, you know, yes. And, uh, and, and a few other instruments just to kind of learn what the ranges were. And now I have a son, 22, is doing the same thing. Yeah. Parker. Yeah. Well, Stan Kent did some really experimental stuff, right? I mean, he, he, he changed quite a bit. Uh, I think he was playing at the Flamingo as well in the early 1960s because he had the great Live at the Flamingo, 61, 62, something like that. Yeah, that was before I got there. But, yeah. but I, you know, in that same era, with the big bands, you could still afford to hire a big band. But, you know, yeah. it, got, it got less and less and less and less after a while. You, and I loved playing in big bands. I mean, yeah. good gosh. It was, yeah. like, yeah. fabulous. And so, so when you were running around Vegas, you had Elvis. So you probably, I think Tom Jones was, was around there as well at the same time. We met at the Riviera one night with a friend of mine, and um, we were sitting in a little uh, uh, lounge seat together in the main room after his show or before uh, things started happening for the afternoon. And I commented on his cufflinks, and he went, here, you have these. Wow. You know? Wow. <laughs> like, I, didn't, I didn't really know water, but, you know, thank you, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so you also had Sinatra was probably running around there again. <laughs> Because he, he retired in 71, came back like 74, 75, something like that. Who? Sinatra. Oh, yeah. Wasn't Sinatra You, you never talked to Sinatra, though. I, no. I was friends with Sammy Davis. Okay. Yeah, and he always had the great parties at Caesars Palace. But, uh, but you know, Dean Martin occasionally, we'd run into each other in, in one, of the, one of the casinos. But Sinatra, you never, you never talked yeah. to Sinatra. Yeah, but it was a unique type of energy that was in Vegas. I mean, if, if one of those guys was in town, I mean, there was energy in all, all the casinos. One of them might walk in. Yeah, there was a frenzy, uh, and they'd always come into a casino in a group, you know, and of course security had to keep everybody away, but they did that as a publicity thing, you know, to keep, keep, keep the movement of the Rat Pack alive. Yeah. And uh, we just, like, backed off and get yeah. away from that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever run into Elvis? Oh, yeah, many times. As a matter of fact, when I was playing at the Flamingo, at the uh, Hilton, uh, we would always precede his show. We had the largest lounge in town, 1,500 seats. Wow. And there was only 800 seats in the main room. And so when Elvis would come in, it would be just before his show, he'd walk right on my stage and say, hey, hi, everybody. You know, and like, <laughs> of course, you're reduced to about this big at that point. You know, you know Elvis was very religious, by the way. Yes. You know that? Yes, yes. And a very good friend of mine, T.G. Shepard, uh, been friends for many years. He's one of the few people that have the TCB necklace made out of diamonds. It means taking care of business. Okay. There was only six or seven of them. And he was so close to Elvis that when he and Elvis would retire for the evening, uh, he would sort of sit there while Elvis would read the Bible until Elvis fell asleep. And then he'd take his glasses off in the Bible and put it next to his bedstand and close the door and let him, let him go to bed. Wow. And that's how, how close T.G. was. And we talk about occasionally about our run-ins with Elvis. And, you know, Elvis was a wonderful person. He was just, he was too good to everybody around him. And then everybody around him gave him whatever he wanted, which included drugs. Yes, yes, shame. yes. And so probably the time he was divorced from Priscilla around 73, sang into Vegas till 76, I believe. So mm -hmm. you, were, you were there, you know, single Elvis, probably a little bit on the plumper side, a little bit, a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, he had kind of blown up a little bit by that time. Yeah. It was sad at the end. I hate to see singers or entertainers get like that at the end of their career when they were so powerful, at the, you know, at the beginning, in the middle of their career. But then things began to reduce and they forget who they are, yeah. you know, I think. And, and, and they let uh, their vices consume them yes and uh 
but he still was a wonderful person. I, I liked him. Yes. So I want to know, so 1985, yep. so we're f kind of fast forwarding about a decade. Yep. 1985, you have a monster year, just, just a, an amazing monster year. Same year, you won Song of the Year for God Bless the USA, obviously. Uh, you were nominated for CMA Top Male Vocalist of the Year for the, ba the great ballad IOU. Uh, won a Grammy for that. Gram okay, Grammy for that. Grammy yes, nomination. Yes, yes. Um, you won Vocal Duo of the Year for your duet with Barbara Mandrell. And then you also were nominated for Entertainer of the Year. Never got nominated for Entertainer of the Year, but I okay. won Male Vocalist okay. of the Year 83 and 84. Uh, and ACM, Academy of Country Music, also won in 83. But 85 was the crowning uh, success where we won Song of the Year for God Bless the USA at the CMA. And that was, that's a big deal, you know, yeah, yeah. to have that credit. So musicians like to speak about paying their dues. It seems like between 1975 and 1985, you, you probably were paying your dues in, in that terminology. What, what was happening in that time frame? Uh, I guess in my pursuit of my career, and I was late when I got to Nashville and started my career at 37. Yeah. I was really struggling trying to find out where I would land because being in Nevada at 17 years old and been that bubble, we play all kinds of music. There was no country on the horizon. Yes. And, and my country's success would come at a time when it was meant to be, but uh, there were others like me, Kenny Rogers, Ronnie Millsap, and a few others who had the same kind of R&B approach. But my background was more like, I mean, if you, if you look at the wide spectrum of people I would listen to, um, anywhere from, you know, the Association, Mamas and Papas, The Fifth Dimension, Elton John, Billy Joel, Kenny Rogers, Barbara Streisand. I mean, you have to throw them all in a pile and say, what the heck were you listening to <laughs> to bring you to country music? Yes. Very little country. I mean, I like Ronnie Millsap an awful lot. I liked his approach because uh, he, again, was a school musician, um, blind from birth. But yes. um, no, I don't think he was blind from birth. I think he lost his eyesight. Um, but it just, I love that kind of approach to the music. I'm a, I'm a James Taylor fan. Really? El, I'm an Elton John fan. I, I mean, those things really inspire me. I'm a Beatles fan. I mean, the, when the Beatles took over, the, the English invasion came, mm -hmm. I was all over that. I mean, you know, we did MacArthur Park, too, in one of our wow. shows there uh, from Richard Harris. Yes. Um, did some of the Beatles songs. I had, a, I had my own show that I, when I, I was in between bands and I, and I hired a group from the Musicians Union and had a great piano conductor named Rudy Egan who, who was my mentor for many years. And, uh, and we wrote the whole show for a 15 piece orchestra and hired them. And I did from beginning to end. And I can remember we did uh, Eleanor Rigby, da 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 With kind of a jazz approach, you know? Yeah. But it, it, it was just, everybody kind of figured I was going to make it. I mean, I had a lot of fans in yeah. Vegas and Reno, and and because I I was responsible for produ producing music for reviews, I would write my music for free and give them to the producers so my band could get the gig. Wow. You know, and I had like show after show after show for five or six years in a row, all award-winning shows. I was the bass player singer for Bear Touch of Vegas, which won seven years awards in a row, and we opened at the Landmark, then we we're at the Stardust, and then the Marina. And different switching around at that time in 73 to 76 i was dealing cards at the tropicana really blackjack well we called it 21 that's, 20, yeah, that's, that's kind of a lame yeah. time rick yeah uh, that, <laughs> yeah that was before they let you surrender and do all the kind of crazy stuff they do today i imagine well yeah i mean anybody surrendered a hand i thought was foolish but uh yeah i dealt 21 baccarat and uh, and roulette okay and i was there for three and a half years and then um while our show was at the Stardust, so I was doubling. I work 11 to 7 dealing cards, and then our first show was 8 o'clock at the Stardust. And then we, uh, our line of girls uh, were booked to do the opening for uh, Paul Lank at Caesar's Palace wow. for three weeks. So I tripled for three weeks and, uh, and got about two hours sleep a night. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> you find you kind you kind of you know why I do that is because it wasn't for the money necessarily. It was because I wanted to find out how much I could do. Sure. Where's my breaking point? Yeah. You know, do I really have a cap? Yeah, yeah. And what's well, the farmer mentality during harvest? Let's see how much I can do. 
I'm not going to pay Absolutely. someone else to harvest this for me. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the things we'd like to do, sort of fun, is I uh, want to give you a gift. The deal with the gift is I want you to tell me a story about why I gave you the gift. And, oh. you, and, you, and you, already, you already spoke to that okay. uh, a second ago, but there's a little tear tab, I think, on the, on the back of it right there. And we okay. can send that to you if you don't have room to, to take that okay. home. Okay, so this, you haven't opened this, so you don't no. know really what's in here. Well, I think I, <laughs> we'll find out, we'll oh. find out. <laughs> okay, so it's like a FedEx envelope. You open that, and you open this, and then you bring out this album. Oh, my gosh. I don't, I don't know if you follow those guys. Dizzy Gillespie and, uh, and the bird. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Charlie, Charlie Parker. Parker. So that Thelonious Monk. You know, Thelonious Monk, they did an interview with him at one time and said, um, what governs the changes of a song? Where does the melody go based upon the... And he said, anything is good. Absolutely anything, even if it's dissonance, as long as it's going somewhere. Wow. As long as it leads somewhere. For a bass player, it's like pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah piano player. Uh, Buddy Rich, of course yep. I knew Buddy Rich. You did. Yeah. You did. Yep. Of course, he, he, he was the one that picked up the pieces after Stan Kitten kind of went, went by the wayside and, and Count Basie went by the wayside. So he was the next big, big band, I think. I mean, I was a huge fan of the Dorseys, you know. Um, Earl Bostick, you know, when yeah. I play saxophone, I think of Earl Bostick in here. Yeah. Um, and uh, Illinois Jaquette, Sam Butera, who played with the Louis Prima and, and, the, uh, and the Witnesses. Wow. I would go in and watch their, their set Woo. after I'd finished my set at the Sahara. We had our show. Well, our shows were after theirs, actually. We started, our first show was 4 in the morning. The second was 5.15 in the morning. We're off. That's a hard schedule to keep because you don't know when to go to sleep. <laughs> and so I'd always go in early and listen to Sam Butera and, and the witnesses, and Sam Butera was like. Yeah. Now, did you, did you ever hear the album of Buddy Rich where his daughter gets up and sings? I did not. Okay. So this is a crazy, crazy story. You couldn't do these days. This is a great gift, by the way. It, it's awesome. a cool gift. It's cool. So those, these guys are kind of the anti-Vegas guys. Like this is the, oh, this yeah. is the bebop. They don't believe in the big band. No, they're New York. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. These are jazz guys. And so uh, Buddy Rich's big band's playing. Uh, his daughter's in the audience. His daughter's like 10, 11 years old. And they call her up. And of course, it's like 1.30 in the morning. It's yeah. in Vegas. And his daughter gets up there to sing. Uh, the beat goes on. The classic. She gets up and she's drunk. He's been letting her How drink all she? night. 10, 11 years old. Oh, she's no. drunk. Oh, no. And they, they have this live album that's out there. And she gets up there and she just nails it. Really? She just nails it. Just, just, I mean, like, no problem whatsoever. Well, that's talent for you. Yeah, yeah. So you've got Buddy Rich. You also had Maynard Ferguson that came out of that Stan Kitten band. And Bobby Shue, after that, playing plead trumpet. I mean, all those guys. Just every, I, everyone that was in Vegas during that time period just had a flood of musical talent just kind of just leak out to the rest of the world. The same thing happened in pop music. Uh, not so much classical. Classical will always stay with the same, but what it is, that's what my, my boy Parker is kind of learning about more classical. Uh, but uh, yeah, jazz evolved. Um, contemporary kind of snuck into jazz a little, and then jazz snuck into everything. I, I really believe that if, if, if you're going to be a good musician, you have to start with... Um, the basics of um, Bach and Beethoven and yes. Haydn and a few others, and then uh, move to jazz. And after jazz, then you go anywhere. You go yes. rock, you know, uh, uh, hip hop, even. Yes. Certainly, uh, certainly adult contemporary music. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. You got Mohawk. You got all Centennial the classics. Centennial celebration. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, and I think I think those guys intellectually are probably superior than a lot of the big band guys as well. I mean, the 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 context, the the texture, the uh, what they're doing with chord changes in bebop is is really really sophisticated, uh, and you you really start to see that and how that crosses over into um, into the big band it goes back and forth, especially in the, the Latin big bands. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember the song Cherokee? Yeah. Okay. So um, the uh, the beginning of the song, the verse of the song is really it's 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 a instrumental, not not a not yeah. a vocal. I've never heard the words to it. I've only heard the instrumental. No, version. there was the, no never any words. Okay. So at the beginning of my career, I was 14 years old. My mother gets a gig playing at the adjacent high school, and she wants to show off her little kid. So bring your saxophone over, come over, you know, and play. And so um, I I. I 
get my horn and I'm nervous and you know these guys are all professional and the and the guy said okay we're gonna play Cherokee you know that uh, yeah I did not know the bridge you know <laughs> and so it's e it's easy to, it's easy to the bridge da, yes. da, 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 de, da. And I'm just sailing along da, 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 da. when we got to the bridge I was like lost I was like I had no clue where it was going on. <laughs> she was so embarrassed she never asked me to play again <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was an F normally, wasn't it? Wasn't Cherokee an F? Yeah, I don't remember. I can't tune. remember that. They might have played something else to make it easy for me because I had an E flat sax. So oh, yeah. It's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. So you've always been really outspoken with your political views, your views on faith, uh, more so than a lot of famous <laughs> musicians. Why, why is that? Why, do you feel, well, do you feel a, a need to speak out? Well, make no mistake, I don't use my stage as a pulpit. Yes. I, I do not talk about my politics unless I'm playing for a conservative group and, and they know that, you know, I mean, I did a couple of Trump rallies where for, there were people there. Um, I did some things for Ronald Reagan, you know, played the White yes. House and stuff. I'm a Reagan, I had to go all the way back there. But when I'm on stage, I'm just a generic entertainer. I try not to let that flow from me because I know other tenors made that mistake and I don't want to alienate anybody. To, to tell the truth, you know, I, I have an awful lot of friends on both sides of the aisle. So yes. it's like, and, and they appreciate that as well. I don't drive that home. Now, if I'm touring with the president or I'm touring with somebody I'm campaigning for them, sure, I'll mention it right away. I'll do uh, newspaper things or whatever and tell, tell why I'm supporting that candidate. Yes. You have probably the most patriotic song in all of America. I think CBS called it the, the most patriotic song ever. Uh, you wrote it, and you mentioned that you're a, you, you wrote a lot of music. How, what was the writing process like to come up with God Bless the USA? Uh, I was touring so heavily that I could not spend time at home writing. I was always on the bus. We would come home, the songs that my producer and I would have chosen we might set aside 25, 30 songs. It'd be one or two of mine in the pile. And I was proud to say that one of my, on my first 10 albums, I had at least one song on every one of the 10 albums. We had some great writers with Jerry Crutchfield at MCA Music. He had first call on so much. I was a hit artist. Uh, our first song, It Turns Me Inside Out, broke charts like never before. 22 weeks on the charts, longest running record at the time. And uh, so we, re people pouring music into us, but I, I was still writing. And, uh, and so God Bless the USA was just one of those. I think it was like 83 in the fall. And, uh, and the reason I, I, I got to that point, I think I'd written several other songs during that year, but I knew that God Bless the USA was not going to be a, a record release for me. I wanted to put it on the album called You Got a Good Love Coming, which is our third album, and then we had a Greatest Hits album as well, in order to just signify that I have a love for my country, and I've had this since I was a teenager. I believed in it. I did USO shows at the age of 14, 15, 16 at McClellan and Mayfair Air Force Base right near my home in Sacramento. Uh, my first international tour was to Alaska before it was a state, and I was just out of high school. And, uh, and so I just, I wanted to profess how much I love the country, and i been uh, seen a lot of servicemen and had sacrifice, including my father, which uh, we didn't talk much about that when I did get to know him. Uh, but he was, you know, he was respected for his service, and I, I respect him for that. So I'm like, maybe, maybe, I, maybe it's time to write that. I had a couple of things in the news at the time. I kind of tried to keep abreast of what's going on in the world. And uh, there was some conflict with the Russians and, the, and America. And, and I, I don't know, it just spur, it inspired me to, to write that song that night. So I, I write it. It's not quite done, you know, uh, but I took it home and I played it for my producer, Jerry. And he said, well, I, I really like that. It's, it's you, know, you know, what you got it done yet? And I, the, I hadn't really pinpointed the cities. Yes. Because I could have put Seattle, Miami, you know, New York, L.A. I wanted because the population centers, it's just, you have to say New York and L.A. Detroit at the time, of course, Motown was very possible, the uh, largest economy for the United States. Houston, of course, because of the oil. Yes. And, uh, and then I, made, I, I mentioned Texas twice because it's just a big state. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, 
it just kind of all flowed after that, you know. Um, and, and I knew that if I mentioned different cities, I had a shot at getting popular in that city, if, you know, at some time in the future. So we had the album, You Got a Good Love Coming. We filmed the video in the London train station. Patrick Duffy was on that uh, as a, from the cast of Dallas as my friend uh, was a cameo. And we were psyched for a summer release on this. And for the, for the very first time, um, Jerry Crushfield and I agreed to take my album to play for Los Angeles. So I'm going to back up and tell you what happened to bring God Bless USA to the forefront. Okay. Marilyn McCoo from the Fifth Dimension was a friend. And on my third or fourth song that we had released, I got invited to do her television show in Los Angeles called Solid Gold. As a guest, you can do whatever songs you want. And I, I did, a, I think, a couple of the songs that I had just released. And uh, it's Halloween night, 1983. And I flew out from Nashville that afternoon. And I had a cassette of God Bless the USA that I just demoed in, in Nashville. Jerry and I had listened to it. It's going to be on the album. We decided to put it on the album. And so I finished the taping for Solid Gold. Marilyn and I exchanged greetings at the end. She gives me a bottle of champagne. Thanks for coming. Come back again, you know, when you can. I go out and I get in my limo. It is 8, 10 or so. I don't fly till the red eye, which is 1.30 in the morning to Nashville. At that time, they had a red I don't know if they still may. And um, I'm like, what am I going to do for four hours, you know? And so I asked the limo driver, I said, where does Irving Azoff live? At the time, Irving Azoff was the president of Universal, which, wow. of course, MCA was part of Universal as yes. a national label. Take me there. Halloween night. So we drive into Hollywood, into Beverly Hills, right up in front of his house, not a gated community. There's about 15 yards between the, the limo at, at, on the street and his front door. Irving Azoff is standing in the front door. It's open. His three little children, dressed as bumblebees, go trick-or-treating. Off they go. And he stands there, seeing the limo pull up, figures somebody he knows. So I get out of the car, grab the champagne. What the heck? <laughs> you know? And I walk right over to him, reach in and grab the cassette out of my pocket. And I said, trick-or-treat. You know what he said? What? Who are you? <laughs> First, <laughs> who are you, you idiot? <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm Lee Greenwood. I'm on your Nashville label. Oh, yeah. Okay, come on in. So we go inside. He said, what do you got? I said, well, a song I wrote that my producer and I think is uh, valuable enough to put on the album. We have a new album. He said, you got a project? Yes. I didn't tell him what we'd chosen the single. Yes. I said, but yeah, we got an up upcoming album. He put it in, listened to the whole thing. Three minutes and 14 seconds, whatever it ran. He said, interesting. He said, when you finish the project, bring it to me. Okay, here's what the, this is where God steps in. Because I, you know, we had never let Los Angeles control us. We were a separate profit center for Reba, me, the Oaks, Barbara Mandrell. We don't want L.A. telling us what to produce. Otherwise, become L.A. music. Yes. And so this album, our fourth, now we said, let's see if we can't get Los Angeles behind us on this one. So we fly to L.A., we go into the office, he's got all the pop boys there. They don't know I'm from Los Angeles, they think I'm a hick. <laughs> so, I guess they didn't do any research on me, they don't have the ability to do that at that time. And so, um, we played the whole album. And so he puts his feet up on the desk and looks at me and he said, what do you think ought to be the single? I knew what the single was going to be already. <laughs> and I said, uh, I kind of looked at Jerry and Jerry and I kind of just like, you know, maybe let him make the choice. So I said, what do you think? And he said, God bless the USA. Wow. wow. Had it not, he had not said that, USA would have been buried in that album. It would have never been heard. And we wouldn't have had that song. That's right. That's it would have right. been my song. Now, maybe something would come of it later, but we don't know that. Sure, sure. 20 years later, 9-11 hits, and you and Kimberly find yourself a few days afterwards at Ground Zero. Yes. Um, I get the call from Mayor Giuliani. And uh, you have to realize that God Bless USA was already used in the Gulf War by General Schwarzkopf. 
Yes. It was already used for Katrina and rebuilding the Gulf Coast. So at this particular time, everybody kind of knows the song. Yes. But he wants me to be there. Mark Anthony's going to sing America the Beautiful. Bette Midler's going to sing The Wind Beneath My Wings, which I was the first one to record that, by the way, before yes. her. And then they want me to sing God Bless the USA at the Fireman's Memorial, where 300 firemen were killed. And uh, it was a... It was gut-wrenching. Um, the New Jersey police brought us in with a boat because you couldn't come in by, by car. And um, it was just, you know, it's hard to explain. The stench in the, in the air was the thing that got me the most from yes. human flesh. Um, we would then sing at the Fire on Memorial. And then on YouTube, you'll have a version with my red, white, and blue jacket at the fourth game of the World Series. Which was also on Halloween, correct. wearing the black leather gloves. That yes. is correct. Yes. Yeah, yes. which I hated. The, I was cold. But, you know, I, I looked at the video and I, the gloves, really? Oh, they worked. You know, they worked. They were cool. I, I was freezing. <laughs> um, so, and and the, the Diamondbacks and winning, winning that series in seven games, but New York pulled it out twice in game five and six. Uh, but uh, it was interesting because then suddenly, God bless you, USA had a new place. Yes. And it became, uh, all of America now become aware of it. Uh, not just the military, not just the country music community or the pop community, but now everybody knew the song. It wasn't for long after that for um, uh, Janet Politano asked if we could play it in the, in the welcome message for new citizens. And I said yes. And it is still there. So. Wow, wow. I remember you specifically on a game four of the World Series. I think half the world was, was figuring out why in the world are these crazy Americans having a game in a city that was just attacked uh, a month, 50 days, 50 days prior to that. And you get up to sing, and somehow, some way, America's in mourning when you start to sing. And somehow, some way, halfway through the song, you can feel America start to heal. God bless the USA. Yep, I felt it too, and it was uh, it was powerful, and and unlike at the time at the tape that we're talking now is the pandemic. We're just getting over the pandemic, but as the uh, the time of that, we could all hug and embrace and share the grief. In the pandemic, we'd not been able to do that. We'd actually separate ourselves from each other, which is really rough because. Uh, we're not that kind of people, you know, we want to feel, touch each other, shake hands, you know, embrace our family, stuff, and been unable to do that, so. Uh. Yes, yes. In your book, Does God Still Bless the USA, you actually open with talking about 9-11. I can tell you, page 18, I, I start tearing up first, talking about walking into ground zero yeah. and uh, just the eerie silence, and then page 20, I think, is you're, you're speaking about the World Series game, just really phenomenally written. It really, was, really was well written. Well, and I have a previous book that we released with Pelican Publishing years ago. It was called uh, uh, God Bless the USA, the biography of a song rather than the author. Okay. Now, I am the author, yes. so I'm going to go ahead and write about it. Um, and then when we wrote, does God still bless the USA? It was the question, are we still the same rest Western nation that got started leaving Great Britain, fought a revolution in order to gain our independence, and based on faith. Are we still that faithful nation? And that's what inspired that book. My wife and I wrote that one together. It was tough. Yes. And you've got the 30 Days uh, Patriotic Devotions at the end as well. She actually wrote that. She did. Wow. Yeah, Kim. Those are powerful. Short, short but powerful. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So what was the thinking behind writing the book? I mean, was it a... Um, was there something happening in America around that time frame that made you think about that? Or was it something that maybe you just wanted to be able to show people that God's still here, God's still present, He's still imminent working through us? How old were you when 9-11 when hit, 2001? I would have been uh, 22. Okay, well, you're yeah. still aware. My boys are 22 and 26 now, but they were 3 and 6 at the time. It didn't take long for us to wear off grief. Yes. You know, um, America needs its sports. America needs its entertainment. Um, we need our freedom. We need our free of lifestyle. And we got back to it pretty quick. So 
within five years, and I came to New York four or five times after that for the New York Stock Exchange, and we sang for the orphans, we sang for the families that were uh, uh, that lost people in the trade towers, and uh, I, I just it, it got it got to bother me that. People sort of, as they moved away from the grief of the of the terrorist attack, and thank goodness Bush 43 was in power at the time, his president, so he made the right decisions about keeping terrorism away from the, con the continent of the United States. And um, it just seemed to me like people were turning away from faith too. Yes. It's like, why, why are you doing that? You know, I mean, we did more of it, not less. And so that's that's what inspired, you know, the book. Yeah. It seems to me like God uses grief, God uses pain to, to get our attention sometimes. You know, it's easy. If you're a Christian, you have, you have that example in your life to say, um, all for the greater good of God. Yes. I don't care if it's bad or good. There's a message here. There's a reason he's doing this. And, and because you'd say, well, why did he let that child die? You know, why do we let all these soldiers die in war? It, well, there's a message there, and we'll learn it later on because... He knows the answer. That's right. That's right. Were there any specific challenges that you faced? We, we spoke about your, your childhood, but that would maybe have been a, a turning point for you where you realize, oh, I've got a choice to make here. Either I can be a victim or I can be a victor. No, I, I don't think. I was driven as a kid, you know. Um, it, and, and the two driving forces were sports and music. And I just pursued that with a passion. I think I lost my religion when I left uh, Sacramento. And uh, those years in Nevada, you know, pursuing my career so, so hard. Uh, there was a couple of failed marriages, you know, just. And I think I was looking for family, and I didn't find it, and those, those women. Uh, I have children, you know, still, that we were very close from those marriages. But it wasn't until I got back to Nashville started touring, and ran into this woman, you know, Kimberly Payne, who brought me back to faith. Her family is uh, serious faith. We just lost Kim's mother last year, uh, very unfortunate. And uh, her father's still alive at the time of this taping. He's 86. And just, just a wonderful, wonderful um, Christian. He goes to the gospel singers in Florida still. Wow. And uh, so I went down there recently with him, and I got to get on stage with the Triumphant Quartet and sing. Oh, wow. Uh, and we were huge fans of the uh, Cathedrals. That was his favorite gospel group, as was, uh, was ours as well. I sang with uh, uh, Glenn Payne uh, before he passed as well on an album. And, uh, you know, we, we, whenever J Jim Payne, my wife's father, comes to the house now, We'll go to the Alexa and say, Alexa, play the cathedrals. You know, so, <laughs> so then he can sit and listen to the cathedrals. And, um, yeah, yeah. So how did you finally answer the question, does God still bless the USA? Well, if you have to get the book to find that out. But um, <laughs> uh, I do give my opinion at the back. Um, but basically, I just, you know, I, 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 I think the jury's still out. I mean, God doesn't bless a country. He blesses a people. And only if we have faith will he, you know, bless us because we have to turn to him for the answers. And we have to rely on him for um, our path in life. And if, if you think you've got the answer, well, then he's not going to bless you. And, and, uh, and, I mean, you know, ask a few of those that he's, that he's turned around. You know? Yes, yeah. Try Saul. <laughs> <laughs> so you wear your faith very, very publicly. Uh, what, is your, what does your faith mean to you? I mean, you've, you've, you've outworked all of us for, for an extended period of time. What has your faith meant through you through that? Do you work be hard, hard because you're, you have a faith that, that requires you to work hard, or, or is it sort of the opposite? I mean, what, what, is the, what is the interplay between your work and your faith? Uh, I pursue my profession uh, for a couple of reasons. I love the spirit of music that flows through me. I have a very unique quality to be able to, um, to communicate with my audience. Yes. There's an awful lot of entertainers I learned that from. You can go all the way back to Elvis if you want. Kenny Rogers, I watched him perform. I toured with him for two or three years. Yeah. Um, there's a magic that happens if an artist can connect with an audience. And so that, that's, my, 
that's my reason for singing and continuing. I'm 78, I'll be 79 shortly, wow. uh, probably in a two or another year, but I, I, I have enjoyed what I do, and I know that through me, God is going to reach a lot of people. Yes. And um, so if I walk the walk, you know, and I talk the talk, I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of people who are going to say, I want to know what drives you. I want to know why you're so strong in your faith. And then I'll sit down and tell them. But Great. I want them to ask me that question. Great. You mentioned Kenny Rogers. Sometimes when you're singing, and I consider you the, the pioneer of crossover. I mean, you can, you can sing anything, country, jazz, contemporary. I, I can hear Kenny Rogers in your voice. I can, I can also hear Michael Bolton in your voice. Or maybe I hear you and Michael Bolton's voice. I'm not sure what it is. But what, what's going on in your mind? I mean, it, are, you, are you purposely changing how you sound based off of what the, what the t type of the music is? Or is it just your voice? Your voice has, has so much flexibility in it that it can... It can transform the, the piece itself. Yeah, I don't, uh, I had to, re because we both understand jazz, Rick, I, I had to relearn how I wrote music and how I interpreted it when I got to Nashville. Our very first song, It Turns Me Inside Out, was very unlike something I had done prior. When we get to our second hit, Ring on Her Finger, Time on Her Hands, now I can push that envelope a little bit. The second song Jan Crutchfield wrote for me, after it turns me into style, it was a song called She's Lion. It was on the same album. At this juncture, now I can really expose my range. Yes. And at the end of the song, instead of doing verse, chorus, verse, chorus, we did verse, verse, chorus. And I went ahead and, and just uh, gave him my high notes, you know, at the end of yeah. that. And I still do that on stage. Because at that point, people went, oh, wait, he's not Kenny Rogers, you know. Because all of those soft notes were much like the way Kenny sang. Right. I also developed a, a vibrato in my voice, which was very similar to Kenny's. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get it from Kenny. I got it from Tata Vega, who was a background singer for Stevie Wonder. And that was just a chance meeting in Los Angeles. Wow. When I found out that when you use your chest for, for your vibrato instead of your throat, it comes out like this. <laughs> And there's even jokes in Nashville, wow. like, you know, it's like, here comes Lee, <laughs> you know, it's like, people make fun of me for it, but I made a lot of money on it, so, I, yes. so I'm okay with that. Um, and Kenny had that same vibrato, and yeah. it just developed differently uh, from different places. Yeah. But uh, it became my signature, and, and it, would, it would be on some of the later songs as well, but that first album has some great songs. When we came to Ain't No Trick, Ain't No Trick on the same album, was basically exposing my R&B roots. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's, that's totally different than It Turns Me Inside Out, which was a tear-jerking ballad. <laughs> and then in 2011, you were covered by Beyonce. God bless the USA. With the gold microphone, and Which, that and that was she was trying to emulate your R and B roots. It sounded like yes, she was, and, and that was flattering. Uh, I, we never met, and, but she donated all the money she made from that recording to the firemen in New York. I, I congratulate wow. her for that. Wow, wow! And then Bette Midler covered your "Wind Beneath My Wings," which I had thought that that was that was very operatic in nature. It was. Yeah, and, and so was um, Gary Morris's version of the song in country because he did he did Le Mis on Broadway, powerful singer, and and totally different version than mine or Bette Midler's. Mm -hmm. um, but I talked to Larry Henley, the one of the writers, and he said the way you interpreted it was the way I thought it should have been done. Yes, but. I mean, you look at the uh, the motion picture it was in with Bette Midler saying what it's called, Beaches? Yeah, Is that the name right, of the, the right. motion yeah, picture? Yeah, yeah. And she was famous for singing it in it, getting give her the credit. She won a Grammy as well. Yeah. Um, and to have her singing at the, uh, at the Fires Memorial couldn't have been more perfect. Yes. You know? I even asked my wife, uh, who was there, we're standing with Mark Anthony, and, and I said, I just, 
I feel I should be singing Amazing Grace. I said, you sure God bless the USA is the right song here? And she said, they want it. They, they want to hear you sing it. So we did. Yeah. Wow. Wow. This is the pre-J-Lo of Mark Anthony. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Different Mark Anthony. What, um, what one other cover that you do is Michael Bolton's from Hercules. I forgot which, what, which song that was, but I, I remember it's hearing It's called that. Go the Distance. That's right. That's right. That's right. But my, I think my best cover, okay. I mean, I do go to Disney on my show because I love it. I actually saw it at Disney World, uh, not Disney World, um, Universal, I think. And they put on the plays there live, and I heard the person sing it in, in the show. I went, yes. oh, my gosh, it's a great song. I hadn't even heard it because I hadn't seen the animated movie. Yes. And uh, so when I heard it in the movie, I went, well, there's a pop version of it that's Michael Bolton. So, and, and I really love it now. He's... I mean, he wears the high range out. You know, I, I hate doing that. Yeah. Uh, I can get that high, but I don't like it. But let me tell you the time I think that I, I did the best cover ever. Um, I played piano bar for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So I, I sang songs from everybody. And I, I love the song, uh, Sometimes When We Touch. So I'm on tour with Kenny Rogers. And there were some things that, that led up to that tour, I had a bus wreck out of Madison, Wisconsin that almost killed my couple members of my band. I'm opening the next night in Ohio. I'm the lead act at the Ohio State Fair. Sylvia's my opening act. And, and to make a long story short, I kept the band with me. We flew in and got on stage and everybody was injured except me because I wasn't in the band bus. I had my own band bus. The next night we open up in Montreal, Canada with Kenny Rogers. So we had to fly into Canada, and I had to replace my bass player with my manager at the time because he played bass for Mel Tillis and knew my music, Larry McFadden, who, by bless his heart, has gone now. And so um, I go to Kenny before the show. God bless the USA is big at this point. And um, I said, Kenny, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable. You know, the French Canadians, I'm going to get lynched here. <laughs> and he said, nah, do it. Yeah. That's the way Kenny was. So... I think it was T. Graham Brown was on first, or Sawyer Brown. I can't remember which was the act, opening act we had at that time. Both were great. So I did a little research, and I found out that Sometimes When We Touch was written by Dan Hill. Dan Hill is from Montreal, Canada. Wow. I said, what could be more perfect? So I opened, I taught, I went in, wrote the chart from a band mm -hmm. that night, and they, they played it. Gene Lorenzo, former, my keyboard player, was formerly with Kenny Rogers in the first edition. Juilliard graduate. He knew exactly how to play it. Yes. And, uh, and, and I can play it at the piano and sing it as well, but I wanted him to do it. I killed it. You know, <laughs> sometimes when we touch, the honesty's too much. And, it, and at the end, it's got that real high note that Dan Hill sings. Uh, I think it's getting a G, so it's a high D. And the audience stood up and applauded. Because in Canada, you have to have 75% of Canadian music played on radio of Canadian artists. Really? Only 25% can be international. So they really love their people. And uh, David Foster's from Canada, yes. a good friend of mine. And uh, Celine Dion, I mean, you know, wow. Michael Bublé, name, name the acts. And so at the end, after my show, I did a 40-minute set. Then I did God Bless You USA. And again, they stand up. Wow. Cool. Wow, wow. So I think that was my best cover ever yes. on stage. I didn't, go to, I didn't do it again uh, hardly at all. I went back to just all the country things that I normally do. What, what happens over time to the human voice, especially the male human voice? So you think of someone like Larnell Harris, Michael Bolton, you. I mean, it seems like somewhere in their 60s, the voice starts getting stronger. It sounds stronger anyway. What? Yeah, not, not the case with Steve Perry, who was, no. you know, Journey, and, and yeah. he lost his voice. I spoke about Jerry Crutchfield, who was a singer at one time, and he lost his ability to sing. I believe that um, Whitney Houston, who had one of the greatest voices yes. I've ever known, um, I believe it was two things that, that caused her to die. And it wasn't drowning in the bathtub. I think she had let her voice go. Mm -hmm. And if you saw the end of her career, just like Elvis's end of his career, it was a shame. I yes. mean, just didn't really have the chops that she had before. And I think when Clive Davis asked her to sing that, that night at the opening of the awards, I think she was scared to death to sing. 
scared to get to get on stage. And I think that's why she resorted into what she knew, drugs. Yes. And so when she got in the bathtub, the drugs just basically passed out and then she drowned. But there, it was the fear yes. of getting on stage and not having the voice. That'll never happen to me, Rick. If, if I get to the point where I can't sing and I know that I want to go on stage tonight for my charity here mm -hmm. in Houston, um, I quit. I will not come on stage and not be what the people expect to hear. I took my wife for our 10th anniversary to, uh, our 20th anniversary to uh, the Hard Rock uh, Cafe in Hollywood, Florida to see Andrew Bocelli. Wow. And I'm curious, I'm such a fan. Can he possibly be that good at this age? Yes, he can. <laughs> so it gives me, it gives me courage to know that. Yes. As long as I have faith in him. Yes. And, and I have a prayer team every morning we talk and I tell them in my prayer team, I said, I have to go to do this gig and I am, I am nervous. I haven't sang at all in 2020, hardly. We did seven shows. So gearing up to 100%, that's a real chore. Yes. I mean, it's hard work. I'm out in the house screaming. I'm playing the piano, everything I know. And for two or three days, my wife says, can you please go downstairs? <laughs> and uh, so I, I don't know what it is. Genetically, I'm blessed. Um, I never had my tonsils taken out at a time when all my generation did. Wow. I'm Vietnam era. And uh, so maybe the tonsils have given my vocal cords strength. I never smoked. That's another key. Yes. Uh, Nat King Cole smoked, but he had this great voice till the end of his career. But he didn't have the kind of power voice that I have. Yes. Nice, soft, easy voice singing. Sing. Um, so I just, uh, I'm blessed with the ability to sing, but I don't abuse it. And I really, you know, I'm grateful for it. We spoke through a number of the, of the real power singers of the 1980s, either Whitney or Steve Perry. One of the lesser remembered power singers of the 1980s was Sandy Patty. Great and, friend. And I was just thinking about that a few years ago, many years ago, George H.W. Bush, you were awarded the Points of Light Award with Sandy Patty. She, she appeared with you. We, we are at Disney World uh, in Orlando, not Disney World, we're in Orlando. And um, yeah, Secret Service was everywhere. And, <laughs> and her and I sang the original song for Points of Light for W. Yes. And uh, George W. And it was just, uh, I, I, just before he died, by the way, he awarded me one of the points of light, which I, I am treasured uh, at, at home. He, he was a very good friend. And so, uh, so the real story for Sandy Patty, in the tribute to America in 1986, it would have to be, I was going to say 76, it would have to be 86, uh, we were invited to Philadelphia. And I can't remember who the host was, a famous commentator. Um, I can't think of his name. You would know him. And, and so Sandy Patty gets up and sings the national anthem in three keys, and she's pregnant. <laughs> she's eight months pregnant. Wow. And, and killed it. You know, <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh, she can, another modulation, higher yet. You know, yes. and she finally came waddling back to the you know, dressing room and kind of panning a little bit, but <laughs> she killed it. And yeah. so Sandy's a, a good friend yeah. and a great singer. It, it must be a challenge for people like you and Sandy who have these strong voices. There's always occasion for, I mentioned the great duet with Barbara Vandrell, to find someone that would actually want to go and sing a duet with you. I mean, you, you only have a handful of people that, that could, you could pair your voice with qualitatively. Yeah, I, I, I could probably, it's, it's a matter of quality. It's a, it's a matter of the intonation and it's a matter of quality matching up. Because I had an album called A Perfect Ten while I was at Liberty, mm -hmm. Liberty Records. I sang with Barbara, I sang with Tanya Tucker. Susie Boggess and I had the best duet called Hopelessly Yours. Okay. Our voices were just perfect together. You know, and I love Barbara. I toured with Barbara. I wrote a, the, the title song for the album called We Were Meant For Each Other. But the hit was called To Me, written by Mike Reed, a former football player. Yes. And, uh, and Barbara and I sang that. And it was interesting, too, because our, our two producers, Tom Collins, who worked for her, Jerry Crutchfield worked for me, they formed a production company because we were both on the MCA label that allowed us to ha have that duet. The production company was called Tom and Jerry Productions, which is <laughs> kind of funny if you're old enough to remember the mouse. You know, Tom, Tom and Jerry, the, the cat and the mouse. Um, but... Uh, there, I don't know who I would ask to sing with if I said, can I have a duet with you? Yeah. You know, that, 
I'm probably like a little like a chameleon. I could probably match my voice to several different singers, but I wouldn't want to change what I do. I just want to um, complement the female voice as well, and and not because because I I'm a very strong singer, so I'd have to have somebody that's that's strong as well, and uh, but I, I'm sure there's a myriad of singers who who would probably you know give me a break singing with me. <laughs> So we're both here in Houston. We'll both be attending the Helping the Hero, Helping a Hero event tonight, which helps veterans, uh, wounded get, warriors, wounded warriors uh, enter their homes of their own. Helps helps buy them those homes and, and finance that. I heard from Meredith Eiler that you've been personally to 27 of those presentations over the years. As many as we can, because I I still am on tour, but I'll fly to wherever the soldier has a home. We try to make the groundbreaking, and then we make the time we give them the key to the house. And um, these are guys that have been seriously wounded. I mean, death was right at the doorstep, you know, losing one arm, two arms, three limbs. We gave a home to this big burly guy had one arm. I can't recall his name at the moment. Um, in a wheelchair because he could not get prosthesis. The wound was above his knees. And uh, he scooped up his daughter and put her on his lap and wheeled himself, you know, wheeled himself into the, into the door with the key that we had given him. I have yet to hear one of these wounded soldiers, these, these heroes, um, have any uh, regrets. I mean, I know that they got dark nights when they're sleeping. Certainly. I mean, gremlins, you know, that will not let, let you alone. But in, in the public, wherever we are, they're always positive. They're, you know, they're conscious of they have to be an example for others, which is, you know, that's a heavy burden. That is. I talked to the, the Purple Heart winners, uh, Medal of Honor winners. They have to wear that medal the rest of their life when they're in public. And they're, uh, they have to be an example for everybody who they left on the battlefield. And then at the same time, give encouragement to those around them and keep a smile on their face when they probably Maybe something inside says, you should, you know, I'm angry or I'm, you know, I shouldn't have this medal or whatever. Um, and these soldiers that we give a home to, these are not cheap houses. No. I mean, four or $500,000 home and it's in a beautiful subdivision. And we gather the whole community together. Everybody that knows we're building this home for this warrior, they come there that for the groundbreaking and then they come back again when we give them the key and the fire department, the police department, generally the mayor, um, Probably the police chief, fire chief, the the uh, national guard. Yes. We have a police escort. Uh, I mean, it's the whole ball of wax. So I know it's hard for them to accept that honor, but at the same time, they're so excited that they can do this for their family, you know. And I want to give a shout out to Justin Lane. Justin Lane was a bomb sniffer in Afghanistan. He did uh, um, advance work to check for bombs in the street. He got blown up a couple times. The last time, took his legs off. And uh, he's about five six, really handsome kid, and uh, I just kind of take a liking to this guy. He yeah. wants to be a musician, singer, and he is. He's got a great band in San Antonio that backs him up, and uh, I'm going to have him on the Opry. I mean, he's going to he's going to come. I'm introduce him to my to my audience as soon as so he gets a little better. But he's he's trying. We build him a, a great home, and uh, and a studio in his house so we can wow. like practice with his band. Wow. Hi, Justin. <laughs> I was at a, a home groundbreaking uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, and there was a 300-acre lake in the in the community. I mean, it was just gorgeous. Yeah. Just gorgeous. It's really pretty spectacular. Is that here in Houston? It was here in Houston, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I hear about soldiers who are overseas deployed and they listen to your song and it just it just changes their spirit, they think of you, and you, you write a little bit about this in your book, that, that Lee Greenwood is, is the consummate patriot, that you're the patriot, that's something that you aspire to be, and that's something that you're certainly known as. How would you define those of us who are not enlisted, that we're, we're here, we're living our lives, we're, we're doing our work, what does it mean to be a patriot? That's a great question, because um, let's go back to the beginning of America. You know, Those people that signed the Declaration of Independence put everything on the line, their family, their lives, their fortunes, everything. That's a patriot. Yes. That'll give everything. <clears throat> Those men and women who, who die on a battlefield, that's a patriot. It's a hero it and is. a patriot. 
Um, but it takes a lot of, uh, there's others that can be patriots as well in supporting the United States and its mission to help other countries be free. Um, I believe politicians are patriots. Mm -hmm. I believe um, civil service workers are patriots. Uh, in the time of our pandemic, our, our frontline workers are, are heroes and, and, and patriots. So it's just not the uniform. And, uh, and, and I never want to misuse the word. You know, but when I titled the album uh, at Capitol Nashville, we, we, we left MC after 14 years and went to Capitol Nashville. My producer and I went together and we produced Help, Hold in a Good Hand, which is a hit album, The Perfect Ten, which is ten girls, all, all duets, and then American Patriot. The reason I titled it American Patriot because I wanted people to know that I was born in the United States. I don't take for granted my citizenship. And those people who become citizens are more patriotic than I am, probably, because they've taken seven years to learn all the things about the United States, probably know the history better than I do. And, uh, but I wanted, I wanted the title of that album to explain to anybody who would have it in their possession and play it, it's for them also. You know, if you want to be an American patriot, learn these songs, learn what they mean to American, uh, Americans. Yes. You've seen some amazing things in your life. A lot of it's centered around music. Music is a very, very powerful force. Powerful force for changing a country, changing lives, instilling values in, our, in the next generation and others. How do you view music as a tool to effectuate change in the world? Um, not until God bless the USA did I think that I was uh, gonna change the world with anything. I was adding to the culture. Mm -hmm. I think my contemporary sound when I came to Nashville, uh, Tennessee in 1979, certainly moved Nashville a little to the uh, contemporary side, a left or right, but contemporary side. Um, and it's cyclical, where it swings back now to the Haddocks. People are more country in their, in their dialogue, their dialect. Yes. You know, they have the southern twang. You could sing a pop song I mean, Darius Rucker is a great example, you know, where um, if, if you have that kind of accent, you know, but then you can, you can do a, an R&B song or a jazz song and make it sound country. Yes. Um, the only thing that made my music country was the fact that uh, I think my soft tones, you know, were very um, understandable, very relatable. And I think that the sincerity of the music, we did song after song after song that had these lyrics that were just powerful. And, uh, but I never set out to, to do that, nor I think that I did until God Bless the USA came along. And then once USA became in the public psych and, um, and I became admired for it, there was, no, there was no way I was gonna turn except through my faith. I mean, I, I wasn't going to go, yeah, I did that. Pretty cool, huh, man? You know, <laughs> it's a great song, isn't it? You know, um, no, um, I mean, I know why God saved me to write that song. It took, took a little time. Yes. You know, it took 30, 40 years to bring me around to that point. But uh, you may not have realized what you had if he gave it to you too soon. I wish I'd have had it a lot sooner. <laughs> I wish I'd have had God Bless You USA during Vietnam. Yeah. Man. What a difference that would have made, you know. And even though I was writing some songs during that era, um, I'm living in Vegas and I'm influenced by the things I'm seeing yes. and feeling right around me, and it just wasn't the same. I didn't have that kind of depth of, you know. There's a few songs that I wrote during that time that I brought forward in my uh, my Schedule A uh, uh, contract with MCA, and now I have it back up to 35 years. And I look at some of the old songs. When I first got to Nashville, um, at the request of then my manager, we ate downtown at some little restaurant across from Vanderbilt. And uh, we're sitting down to eat, and I hear this voice behind me say, W bar X, rockin' horse, why? And it's a song I had written about a year ago. And I'm, what the heck? I turn around, and it's Dwayne Allen of the Oak Ridge Boys. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Larry knew him and had sent him the tape. I met, uh, before I moved to Nashville, I was in Los Angeles trying to get my record career going, and there's a, a circular Holiday Inn right off 405, mm -hmm. and there's a restaurant at the top, and so 
I went there to have a drink with somebody, and I'm sitting at the bar, and the guy next to me says, I know who you are. And he had a little bit of a, a, an accent. I knew he was from the South somewhere. And I looked at him, and I said, you're Roger Miller. And he said, yes. And he said, and I can feel the groundswell in Nashville. <laughs> so again, wow. you know, it kind of proceeded before I went. And I'll tell you, Rick, I, I was in no hurry to leave Vegas. I, I yeah. liked living there. I liked the success it gave me. I was making really good money in 1976, 77. I'm like, I ain't leaving this place, you yes. know. Yeah. But there was a cap. And the cap was I couldn't go from the Frontier Hotel lounge to the main room at the Sands until I went to Nashville. That's right. And when I did come back as a star, I opened for the Oak Ridge Boys, I opened for Crystal Gale. Then I started taking my own, my own spot, mm -hmm. you know. You think growing up, I, I think I read that you would take your, you would throw your baseball glove in your saxophone case and that's how you would go to school and go around everywhere. Where did you hear that? Because that's a true story. <laughs> um, my grandparents, see, I, I wasn't under the guardianship of my mother. Yes. She was just too busy. Married three times, divorced three times. Finally found the man she loved, Louis D'Antonoli, my stepfather, who I loved dearly before he passed on. Um, but because... Um, I really wouldn't take lessons from her in the piano. That's just the way it is. You don't take from your parents. I try. Yeah. I've tried to give my kid Parker some ex, some some examples of the piano. Dad, go away. I got this. Fine. So it's exactly what happened with me and my mom. And I, I was like, I'm not going to play it your way. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. So I said I quit, and I went and played baseball. So she got frustrated that I'm not going to learn her instrument. Somehow she found an alto saxophone. I think it's because her grandfather, my, my grandfather, Tom Jackson, his brother played saxophone. Okay. And I think that was the only reason she brought me a saxophone. Well, I took to it like a duck takes to water. I was learning songs off the radio within the first two weeks. I already learned how to get the armature set. I was playing. So my grandparents, that summer, I guess I was 13. I'm thinking 55 for... 54, 53, 54. Um, they sent me to summer school to learn how to play saxophone better because mm -hmm. I didn't play at the house much. So the first day I go to summer school and the teacher, there's four or five of us there and we're all supposed to play something. It was a couple of trumpets and a trombone and went on playing saxophone. And he saw how I was making a note on the side. He said, no, you can't do that. You have to move move your finger down here. And I said, that doesn't feel comfortable. I said, I, I can make the same note here. No, you have to do it that way. Well, that pissed me off. Yeah. <laughs> so the next day, I took my saxophone out, put it in, under my bed, and I put my baseball mitt in the sax case, put it on my bicycle, and I rode over there and went to the baseball park. So all summer, I played baseball, and they never knew I didn't take a lesson because I kept getting better. <laughs> and then I also got better at baseball. As a matter of fact, I became an all-star. Wow. Just because I played that whole summer, hardball. Wow, wow. So I want to submit to you the idea that you were drawn to Vegas, probably. Because if I think about the types of music, the kinds, of, kinds of albums that were coming out when you were a teenager, and even early 20s where you were already in that, in that crowd, you, you look at Sinatra at the Sands with the Count Basie Orchestra, 1966. You look at Kenton's big band stuff much earlier than that, 61, 62, stuff like that. And it was all, it was all happening in Vegas. Yeah. Let me put the geography in proper perspective for those who might be watching and don't travel much. My mother, we lived in the Los Angeles, partially. Uh, when I, and I asked her later on in life, I said, I know you've never flown on an airplane. She said, that's true. I said, how far east have you driven? So I, I went all the way to Nevada. Well, if you know your geography, Nevada's right next to California. <laughs> wasn't until I started touring, until I got the, the vastness of our country yes. and the beauty of it coast to coast. But uh, living in Vegas, I mean, it's a dry place. It's hot. You know, I mean, it, 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 it is a bubble. But yes. the influences are still there uh, from all over if you want to listen to them. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I Spe speaking of Sin City, you have a new Bible project coming out very, very soon. I found it interesting that a guy that got his chops in Vegas is now publishing a Bible. Tell, tell, tell us about that. I'm excited about this. Um, as, I, as I wind down my career, and I say that 
broadly. Um, may tour one more year. We have, I have a team that's looking for branding ideas, okay. things things that will I can put my name on, associate myself with, and uh, bring us a revenue stream and so forth if I need it, if my wife needs it, if I pass on. And so they said, how would you like to uh, be associated with a Bible? I said, I'm a man of faith. Of course I would love that. So they bring us this idea that they're going to have a leather-bound true Bible, Old and New Testament. It's the full text, nothing in the middle. Like a lot of Bibles come out with reasons to have something in the middle. Yes. It's an NIV version. Okay. Leather-bound cover says Holy Bible at the top, which is what it is. Directly under that, God bless the USA. And at the bottom, it has two military flags, like in a V. Front cover, they asked me if I would write the lyrics of God Bless the USA, but just the chorus. I'm proud to be American when Lisa know I'm free, just the chorus. And I, and I signed it. That's the only place my name appears in the Bible. I said, my name will never appear next to Jesus Christ. Yes. I promise you. <laughs> I won't last long if that happens. So it was a copy, and that's the copy of the front, inside the front page. In the back, when you turn the Bible over and you finish uh, uh, the, the, the last book, then it's uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. The reason I liked this idea was because, not just for new citizens that come into the country, but everybody else who maybe not remember what those documents say. Yes. So through faith and how this country gets started, I'm offering an example of, our, of those documents you may never be able to see unless you go to the library or you look it up on your internet. It's at, it's your bedside. It's right here. That's great. So it, when you have a question in the Bible at a particular time, how does this apply to when America got started or her, where we are now? Go ahead and read some of the Constitution. See what it says. Look at the amendments and see those amendments we have, you know, yeah. why they're there. Yes. The whole concept of, of inalienable or un unalienable rights are just all right there based in the Bible. Unalienable yeah. rights. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And a lot of conversation about the Second Amendment. I'm more concerned about the First Amendment, really, yes. you know, freedom of speech. Yes. October 12th, you have the big concert in Alabama. Salute to Lee Greenwood. Tell, tell us about that. This is a tribute to my music, not to me. Um, I wanted, before I quit touring, I wanted to do one of these shows, and we had one for Kenny Rogers, we had one for Michael W. Smith in Nashville, Bridgestone Arena. This is gonna be at Huntsville at the Von Braun Center. It's 10,000 seats. I've played there a couple times before. Beautiful venue. Um, it's to honor the writers, the singers, musicians, producers, engineers that made 40 years of hits for me. And so I've invited 40 singers wow. from all walks of life, you know, mostly country, but outside that as well, um, who will sing my songs while I sit there and listen to them. No pressure. No, no pressure, pressure at all. <laughs> oh, I, I have no doubt. Whoever we pair with one of my songs is going to do a fabulous job. I, you know, these are people I admire. These are great singers, all of them, and uh, and they're going to interpret my music differently than I did. But it's going to be kind of cool to hear it. But you will way. perform at least one song. I you know, hope. I would hope. I, I like the. I'd like. I'd hope that that the producer will let me do that. Is, <laughs> is sing uh, at least "God Bless USA" at the end. Yes. But everything else, I'm hands off. Yes. Yes. As we start to wind down our time together, there's been an absence of personal responsibility. A guy like you who grew up on a, on a farm, you learned how to work hard, you have your work ethic. That's very, very evident in your success. But we see a, a newer generation coming forward that maybe doesn't have the sort of work ethic, that doesn't want to take responsibility for their own actions. Maybe they, they blame others for the situations that they're, they're in. How do we fix this evident problem of people not wanting to be personally responsible here in the United States and, and a lack of, of general work ethic and wanting things to be given to them. I don't see it in my family. I mean, I got a 22 year old and a 26 year old and they're hard workers. My wife's a hard worker. You know, we, we project that. I believe it, I have to blame parents if, you know, we all want to give our kids a better life. We certainly have the resources to have our kids spend their, their youth in the Caribbean. No, you know, you work, work hard, you know, and, and unlike me, uh, Dalton, our 26-year-old, was the first kid in my, in my family to go to college. Wow. So it wasn't that. It was get out of high school, go to work. So maybe that's the reason, is that many people have more opportunities today to find a higher trade 
and not just father and son businesses because that's kind of gone away. Yes. Uh, very few kids want to be a plumber like their dad. I don't know why, but uh, it's, they make pretty good money. <laughs> uh, but it, I, it may be the fact that they get higher learning and go on to college and then, then they don't have that serious work ethic like if I don't make money, I'm going to starve. Yes. You know? And that was it. And the thing that drove me as a kid was not just my my responsibility that I learned by being a farmer or having my first band and know I was responsible for five other guys to work is that if I wanted to put pressure on myself, I went and bought a new car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of work. Go buy a new car. Now you better go to That'll work or you're going to lose the car. <laughs> you know, if you're going to lose something, you yes. know, that's valuable, uh, that you probably will have a, a, a more incentive to work really hard. And, uh, and and maybe not the way I was driven as a kid. I mean, I'm. It's hard to wear me down. I'm like the Energizer Rabbit. But <laughs> what is your greatest hope for America over the next five or ten years? What would you like to see happen? I like to see go back to where we were with time of peace. I'd like to America be the leader of the world like it was as I remember it. Um, let's say after Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to see the the whole world, and we are becoming more worldly, with uh, the trade deficit with China and 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 conflict with um, with regimes that would like to kill us, and I'm talking about North Korea yes. and uh, um, Iran, you know, where terrorism is bred. I I, it, I hate that it's become a religious uh, thing, a religious conflict. Because it seems like more and more, we're going back to the days of Israel, you know, yeah. and and uh, and to try to settle the Palestinian Israel issue. I mean, gosh darn, that was amazing. Uh, at least we got to the place we could talk and not kill each other. But I wish the whole world would be. And I have a joke about the only way we're going to bring peace to the entire world is have an alien attack. I mean, it's got to come from <laughs> Mars to you know, yeah. the whole world. Wait a minute. You know, you saw the movie uh, uh, um, Independence Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that's what it is. It's like, wait a minute. There's some, okay, let's all band together here, can we? You know, please. Uh, and, and at any time, I'm sure that's happened when common enemies have a deeper threat and they become friends. What's, what's the, the, the theory of the... the the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, yes. or something. I forget how that goes. Um, but uh, enemy mine, that was the, the show. Yes. But I, uh, I just wish for peace, and I pray for peace. But it's going to be a long time coming unless the Lord has something else to do with it. And, you know, we see so many things that draw you to, is this the end of days? I mean, I'm sure people have had that question for as long as humanity's known Christ. Um, it's like they, there'll be signs, you know. Uh, and it's funny because we had the breakout of the locust the other day, and and Dalton, my older boy, said, uh, "This could be it, Dad." You know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it could be, son, but you're not going to know it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, Lee, thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for your example. I mean, you're you're an icon. You are a rock star, literally. <laughs> and uh, it's such an honor to spend a few minutes with you. Thanks so much for sharing for your heart and your, for most part, for the most thing your patriotism and your example of how we should live our lives as Americans. Well, I was proud to be in the mansion. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Rick.